have to suffice because it's copyright waffle, copyright waffle, copyright waffle. All right. Oh, All right. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> We're I back. I should be saying uh, Dobre Utra, shouldn't you, Chris? No, uh, yeah, Dobro Utro, which is, we can, or Dobarden. We will talk a bit about more about that in a moment. Um, so I am Chris Morrison, uh, and you are, who are you? I'm Jane Secker, and um, together we're the Copyright and Online Learning Special Interest Group co chairs of um, the Alt Group. <laughs> the Alt, the Association for Learning Technology, Copyright and Online Learning Special Interest Group. Um, us here today. That's yeah. us, um, and we are back after. Uh, a, a, bit break. Of a, break. Was a, a brief hiatus wasn't there we took april off not entirely yes. off but we just no. didn't do a, a webinar but this is now webinar number 49 um, we transitioned from the time of, of crisis of greatness. Brink of indeed, greatness. To, to a time of uncertainty but here we are um and i think we are really looking forward to today i certainly am are you yeah absolutely yes yes tell us all about what we've got lined up then chris come on we've got right well we've got some copyright news as ever we have, uh, we have. And we, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment when we get into it. Um, we've got an exciting Can announcement. I might be a reason why we say good morning in Bulgarian. It may be, yeah, yeah. I think Ross um, might be Bulgarian. But the main event today is Kate Vasily joining us from uh, Middlesex. U well, she's joining us from home, I believe, but uh, <laughs> from Middlesex University, many people will know Kate. And we'll uh, be introducing her in a moment copyright and accessibility tools, a topic that's come up several times. Um, and we're going to have a really interesting discussion, some great insights as to how we might approach that. Certainly how Kate uh, has been looking at it and thinking about it. Um, uh, so it's going to be a good one today. Uh, you know, uh, yep, it, it always absolutely. is good, but this yep. one, uh, no exception. Right. So we, since we, we last met, what have we been up to? We since we last met, yes. Okay. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, we've got a couple of things here. So we've got um, this T-shirt I'm wearing at the moment. Those people watching the YouTube version of this won't be able to see us at the moment. We'll, we'll, we'll show off later. But this uh, is my gift on my leaving due. Um, <laughs> and so I left the University of Kent. That was last week on friday it was postponed by a week because i got the dreaded covid so i couldn't have my leaving due um on my last day I had to do it a week later um, um so we'll come back to that. we've got a couple of slides just to show you how amazing this thing is um, yes yes that, that chris jones has created um and i'm just trying to see is is chris joining us today i can't see him on the list so maybe that I'm we not have sure. to i'll uh, have a look i'll have a look in, we'll see yeah, we in can... his absence and then the, yeah. the other photo well what's the other thing so the other photo is this is this is us um outside. that's not famisham is it no no we we, we left kent didn't we mm. we we got on a plane it was i have to say the first time for um well uh, over two years unsurprisingly i'm sure many of you haven't yet got on a plane but they do still work in the same way and we went to bulgaria so this is us right in the center of uh, sofia in bulgaria and uh, this is the main, or one of the main, they've got many, many churches, um, but they, this is the, one of the main cathedrals that's right in the center um, that we, we spent some time walking around, didn't we actually, trying to meet various people from the conference we were at. Um, so are we gonna say a bit more about that or we'll, we'll leave that to later, what we were up to? I think it, we have got it as one of our news items, haven't we, what we were actually we doing have. there we um, have but so. it was really it was really great because for those who don't know the term um copyright literacy um does actually come from research that started in bulgaria and so it was a really exciting um, opportunity to go and meet um who, who we called the grandmother of copyright literacy didn't we i called her, i said it was the God, she's the godmother isn't she but she may be the grandmother but dr tanya well, she, did because she is now a grandmother so well, she was yes, very proud yeah. of that um, so it was yes it was a fantastic um opportunity to travel and also exhausting and <laughs> all those other things that international travel yeah. is um yeah so the, the going back to that that picture there i just wanted to show you here this is the picture that chris jones reading university put together for my leaving do now as you can see this is 
a, 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 just an incredible uh, piece of work. Uh, slightly disturbing, maybe some of those things. I'm sure everyone could see what it is, would recognize that <laughs> image and know that I'm a, a massive Beatles fan. But can you spot all the things that are going on in this picture? Can, can anyone see themselves in the picture? Any of the faces? Can anyone see what it what the relevance might be? Anyone who was anyone at the last Icebox in 2019 know, might recognise that there they are. Um, now, what we are planning on doing with this is sharing it. We'll obviously be speaking to Chris to make sure he's all on board with it. But to share this image, um, and yes, Evelyn, absolutely. Now, they are all interesting copyright cases. Not only did Chris put the effort into putting this together, um, and a combination of copyright facts and sort of rather strange pictures of me uh, and people that I know, uh, he and has of course, cat is in it, just to say. He people has, of course, in. created this reading list, fully cited, everything to an absolutely meticulous level of detail about everything that is on that image. So it's an absolute, uh, it's, it's an amazing piece of work. Uh, so it I want to say thank, thank you so much, Chris, for that. Um, and thank you to everybody who, uh, you know, said nice things about me um as i moved on it all a bit strange really uh sort of delayed kind of not remote but slightly remote thing but this really made it yeah it's it's fantastic mm. um mm. yeah we're hoping we can let everyone have a, a closer look at that at some point um fairly soon and we're just gonna i think what, what would be great is to have an interactive version where you can just roll over the figures and actually see what what's going on it might actually be um, pop up. One of my ex-colleagues, Jose Belido, lecturer in intellectual property law at our law school, saw it and said, can I actually, can I use this with my students? So mm. they, it, he's, you know, it, it's actually going to be. Just flick back to it once more. Just flick so back to it one more time. Let's just have a quick look yeah, at that. Let's look at it in its, all so its we magnificence. we can see several members of uh, this parish are included on it. Um, Absolutely. Yes. Interesting yes. that Ruth, who's who's my new boss, is kind of poking her head over the top of my head. So she's obviously keeping an eye on me. Um, and it looks good on rice paper. Yes, yes. Thank you, Chris. Um, and for helping yes, arrange so all those cakes. For those who didn't see, there was actually also, I, I tweeted some stuff about this. And there was also this picture put onto a cake for Chris as well. So he got to eat yes. this too. We did. Um, OK, I think it's time to move on from this. Uh, I think so. Let's move on. Yes. Yeah. OK, so this is a reminder that we have the webinar and blog archive. We actually have, as I mentioned, YouTube number of images now on the uh, alt YouTube playlist or videos on the playlist, and which can be easier to um, to play than getting into that or collaborate room. But it's all there if you want to go back and see previous ones. Um, but now, uh, without further ado. That's right, it's copyright news. Um, it item is. number one. So, so we mentioned this. This was why we were in Bulgaria. So you okay. wanted me you to want talk to about this? Up? Yes, yes, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, so the um, Decris, um, or Decris, actually, as most people were calling it, we discovered um, in, at the conference. Uh, it's I'm just popping the link into it. It's a, a, a Erasmus funded project. Um, they have run a number of events to bring the project partners together, but also to bring um, some uh, sort of are interesting experts in the field. So digital education for crisis situations, times when there is no alternative. Um, the partners of the project are from Germany, Spain, Bulgaria and Croatia. And um, what they're actually doing is looking at um, the role that open educational resources play in teaching, but very specifically, and something that actually didn't occur to Chris and I till we got there is, it's actually a project led by four of the library science um, or library and information studies um, schools around Europe. So they're, they're actually looking to share their teaching materials as OERs. So it's materials for teaching librarians. And we were really 
really delighted to be asked to do a keynote to open the event um, and to talk about the role that copyright plays when we're thinking about openly licensing educational resources. So it was just fantastic, wasn't it, Chris? Really good to be out there and to meet, really good. Um, you know, people from all around Europe working in uh, similar sort of areas. Yeah, it was fantastic. Um, but also very nice to get back home. Uh, <laughs> so it's all good international travel is good but tiring uh but that was where we were so we hope to see more um the lilac uh conference archive is available so this is we just wanted to draw people's attention to that because we were talking we presented um at that uh event with the canadian team of amanda and celine on copyright anxiety uh uh, and it was a it was a it was a good session, wasn't it? Again, Lilac actually face to face. Um, yes, yes, which was, yes. So this was before uh, before Easter, um, yeah. and uh, at Manchester Metropolitan University, um, we did see some of you there in person as well, which was fantastic. And uh, there was a, a a couple of other sessions about copyright, and the full program is actually now up, so you can have a look at the slides. There's that link I've just popped into the chat takes you to the archive of presentations, and it's alphabetical by author surname, I think. Um, yeah. But yeah, you can ha you can have a look at some of the, the the papers. But just, I mean, really, uh, you know, obviously, if for some people they're not ready yet to go back to face to face, but um, there was a great buzz and it was lovely to be at the lilac conference and and see lots of people again so yeah that was a, a really uh, a really a really good time yes next item uh, Chris. next item so this is a report we mentioned this in our keynote uh because ifla have pulled together they put a, uh, out a survey and some uh, statistics on an international level how did libraries respond to the pandemic or how did copyright impact on their activities during the pandemic uh, so we see here that 83 percent of the respondents uh, from 29 countries said they had copyright related challenges during um, you know as a result of library closures and we also picked out of here that 52 percent of libraries um, had identified that those problems related to international cross-border access students return to their home countries, different licenses, different technological infrastructure. Um, so these are things that we've seen in our community, but what we always want to do is make sure we're linking this back to the international see whether we can learn from others and, and, and share our experiences. So this is an interesting piece of research, very useful. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And there is uh, a summary report, which is what the top link was taking you to. But just I think yesterday, IFLA put up the full report and I understand they're using it to um, uh, for discussions uh, when they attend WIPO, aren't they? I think um, a bit yes. later this year. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so that's a good one. The next thing we've got here. So you and again, you went to an actual real event. I did, yes. So um, Association for Learning Technology also run um, the OER conference, the Open Educational Resources Conference. Um, OER 22 was um, a hybrid event. Um, so there was a day in person in London um, in a very spacious, airy venue. Um, and then there was uh, an asynchronous day and then there was a, a fully online day on the third day. And I think they're making a lot of the presentations available um, from the conference. But um, I was invited at the end of the day to sit on um, a panel discussing open textbooks with colleagues from um, University of Edinburgh, so Lorna Campbell, um, with uh, the Director of Library Services, um, Gary, who's at the Open University, and also with um, Adara, who is the Open Textbooks Manager at UCL. Um, so really interesting. I'm not going to say too much more about it. The, the, the link is up on YouTube if you'd like to um, have a watch about the sorts of things we talked about. Um, unsurprisingly, I talked a little bit about the role that copyright might play. And we kind of talk about um, what's happening in the sort of open textbook space and, um, you know, what some of the institutions are doing um, around uh, open educational resources. And we are going to get uh, this is a topic on one of the webinars in future, aren't we? 
we absolutely are. I've already been in touch um, with with Dara at, at UCL. Um, we'll probably be looking um, for another speaker as well about open textbooks. There was a great presentation from the University of Sussex about what they're doing as well. So um, yeah, we're, we, we're lining that one up, I think, for uh, probably July sort of time. Um, and yeah, watch this space. So the next one is an event, um, Knowledge Rights 21 are putting on their first webinar. So I think we've spoken about Knowledge Rights 21 in the past. This is uh, a project to uh, spread or help um, raise awareness, understanding of copyright across Europe um, in, and in the library information profession and they are looking at a number of different areas and this one is looking at unsustainable ebook markets so something we are aware of and we've spoken about here before and related to the question about open textbooks looking at current licensing models so this is on the 19th of may um, and you can sign up for that if you want to see more uh, about what's happening there so uh, mm -hmm. i think a useful a useful session to be um to be joining if you can Okay, so, so uh, one we need more a bit, bit of drum views, roll now, there? don't we? Do we need a drum yes. roll, Chris? Drum uh, roll, I don't have roll. a drum. Final announcement, we're going to get on to the main act now. We know there's quite a few things to get up on. But Boom. Ice Pops 2022. It's, it's, <laughs> it's happening. It's real. Thank you to everybody who responded to our survey to ask about feasibility, whether they'd still be prepared to go, what the date, the location, and we understand that there was always going to be some uncertainty about face-to-face -face events. Exactly the timing will be tricky. We could, you know, what we've done in the past is had ice pops um, at, in June around that time, but we were really keen to bring our community back together. Those mm. of us who are working in copyright education um, and looking at uh, playful and creative ways of doing it. So ice pops for anyone that hasn't um, been aware of it is the international copyright literacy event with playful opportunities for practitioners and scholars we it is using the classic now format this will be the third face-to-face -face edition but the fourth in total because we had our online i can't believe it's not ice pops last year but this is going to be at oxford university museum of natural history we've got a fantastic venue for the event uh, we we've have. got some uh, incredible, well, we've got the keynotes we'd initially had lined up for 2020 will be joining us, but a lot's happened in the intervening time. And in fact, there's a lot to catch up on. We've got Emily Hudson talking about the parody pastiche exception and making that really interactive. And we've got uh, Douglas McCarthy and Andrea Wallace, who are the open glam duo, talking to us about their work in open glam galleries, libraries, archives, museum. Um, and there's been quite a lot of work in that space as well. Um, Doug is at the Europeana Foundation. Andrea has been doing a lot of work on the Towards a National Collection. Um, and it's just going to be a brilliant event. Um, Call for Contributions is there. So if you want to contribute, we've got the classic World Cafe. We've got the classic lightning talks, opportunities to share what you're doing or just ideas about how you might approach stuff. Um, and I think we've got... Um, Kyle Courtney has got it in his diary. We're hopefully going to yeah, get a fantastic yes. Kyle back yes. in the UK. So we're really, really pleased that we're able to announce this. And just to say, this is a bit of a sneak preview. So we haven't actually, we haven't got a booking page up yet. Um, we've got information about the costs. Um, we've got our sponsors lined up, but we are, will be getting in touch um, and sending out further details um, next week um, about this. So this is a, a special advance uh have get get your get your thinking caps on we're really hoping obviously we do get a good number of people who would like to come along and, and speak at the event as well so um any any ideas you've got have a look at our call for contributions so yeah and and uh karen is absolutely right it is an amazing venue um but we now will move on to the main event um accessibility tools and copyright with kate vasili kate are you there copyright officer extraordinaire from middlesex university i hope you don't mind that being your uh, your title um, <laughs> wow 
<laughs> no pressure. No, no, no pressure. pressure okay, you've, you, you've, you've been, um, I think most, many, many people here will, will know you well. You introduced to us your copyright journey, how you became a copyright specialist um, a few webinars ago. Uh, so we're delighted to have you talking on this topic. It came up as part of the, uh, the discussions on List CopySeq, didn't it, about how do we deal with accessibility tools? And then we have a, a working group as part of the uh, the cool SIG uh, committee. We've got a separate group, and 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 they were asking you to uh, see if you could expand on some of the things you were talking about on the list. So here's the opportunity for you to to give us some of your insights and spark some conversations about how we deal with this and the risk of using various tools. So yeah. over to you if if you're okay. We can I'll get your yeah. slides up. Oh wow, the slides are coming up. Wow, brilliant. Just like um, magic, Chris. Just like magic. Just magic. like magic. Just like magic. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> no <laughs> worries. Um, so, hi everyone. A lot of you probably already know me, um, Kate Vasili, Copyright Officer for Middlesex University, and by no means um, an expert. I've learned, like many of you on this list, just by doing the job and picking up things as you go along, asking questions, reading answers, and, and just sort of accumulating the knowledge as you go along. So again, accidental journey is not something I planned to do as a child. Um, so as Chris said, I was uh, well, I was really responded to a question on this copy seek and that sort of sparked um, further discussions in the Alt SIG accessibility group uh, meeting. So they asked me to, pre to prepare a paper, so to speak, on what I'd said and to elaborate on some of the things that I'd mentioned. So this is basically a presentation on that paper, um, just giving you some insights of why um, maybe it's not so scary to use these accessibility tools and have them available um, to your students. So if this changes, let me just check. Right. If you can't get it to move, I'm happy to do the old next slide thing and I'll move them along for you. I'll just try one more thing. And if not, yeah, it's not moving. Okay. Oh, hold on. Hold oh. on. There you go. Okay, Did I'll it. jump you forward. Sorry. Oh, no, right. it's Back to you. Work. Worked it out. There you go. So the accessibility tools I'll be talking about are Blackboard Ally and also census access, which many of you will have heard of by now. And, and I know a lot of you who are already integrated into your um, platforms and your systems at your universities. I have to add, there are similar products may be available. So just, just, a, just, just a reminder, because I know there's probably other technology companies busily trying to create the same sort of products. Um, for this. Blackboard Ally doesn't only work on Blackboard, obviously Blackboard and Moodle have uh, are, have merged and um, so it works on Moodle as well. So it's not just that. This is just a brief um, rundown of the features of each of the accessibility tools. So Blackboard Ally is a VLE integrated application, whereas Census Access is a web-based platform um, and also an LTI plugin. So Although there is uh, a web form available publicly on their website, um, any organisations that want to use it have to subscribe and use their plugin. Um, there's a VLE content accessibility feedback forward with a Blackboard Ally. Um, the format request icon is attached to individual items in Blackboard, so you can, they can be switched on and off. And there's also no file size limit, whereas with um, census access, there is a file size limit. So you can't um, upload huge files um, without their contacting them first. Um, I did mention already that the web, web form is available um, to subscribing institutions to put anywhere on their own websites. But there's also a public version which they use as mainly as a test. So you can see how it works before you subscribe. Um, the preferred format selection for both of them are, are almost the same. Um, they've got seven each. With census access, they have DAISY as well. So DAISY talking books in 24 languages. I'm not sure about different languages with Blackboard Ally, but Middlesex, we don't actually have it, which is a bit um, 
tongue in cheek that I'm presenting on something we don't have at Middlesex, but never mind. Um, and they also both do Ebro. Oh, they do have translations. Sorry, I'm talking rubbish now. They do have translations, but I'm not sure which languages, whereas um, census access actually specify the languages. There's instant download from Blackboard Allo, whereas census access actually email the, the converted file back to the requester. So they have to put in their email address when they make the request. So the main concern that came up on List Copy Seek and everywhere else as well is that the disability exceptions in the Copyright Designs and Patents Act only apply to um, making accessible copies for disabled persons who meet the certain criteria, i.e. in the Equality Act 2010. Um, but these accessibility tools are made freely available to all staff and students via the institutions VLE or web pages, etc., which allows them to then download content in any format of their choice. So the question is, are we aiding or encouraging copyright infringement by making these tools available to the wider cohort? So that's the burning question and the main concern with these tools. So. I started scratching my head or my chin as the image implies <laughs> and I may be wrong but and then this is um, the legal disclaimer I may have legal qualifications but I'm not a lawyer so anything I say from here on reflects my own personal opinions viewpoints and analyses and should not be construed as legal advice blah 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 sorry about that but I had to say it <laughs> So reasons why it's highly unlikely that we are um, sort of aiding or encouraging copyright infringement. First, I'll go through each of these different aspects. So we're going to talk about the content first, what type of content and the copyright status, etc. Et and why, how they've been provided. Then the amount, so what's likely to be provided, how much. The purpose, why it's there. Then the, we'll talk about the legal exceptions. Um, and, you know, there might be other reasons that you can use it or you've made it available. And then obviously there has to be a risk assessment on all of these um, aspects. So the content, mostly it's academic authorship. So you've got lecture slides, lecture notes, maybe um, assignments, quest exam questions, um, projects, setting assignments etc which the university will own so there wouldn't be a copyright issue with those however the student wanted to download them the main problem would be third party content and these on a vle mainly are often provided via links to the online reading list so again it's taking it off the vle platform copies from third party content are either licensed or with permissions, or we like to think they are anyway. Um, so they're either under a primary license, so where the university has subscribed to the content or purchased ebooks, etc., or they've, um, they've obtained permissions directly from the publishers or the copyright owners. Then there's secondary licensing which we call collective licensing. So the CLA, NLA, we're allowed to upload content under those licenses within their parameters, or their restrictions. And then there's legal exceptions. So we might have uploaded content under section 30 for quotation and criticism review, or section 32, illustration for instruction, which is probably the main one for um, a VLE or VLE content but also section 36, which also works in line with the CLA. So anything that's not CLA licensed could be copied under section 36 within the very limited 5%, obviously. Um, and then we have direct links to external content. So external websites, there might be links to a topical website that the academic wants students to look at, and also library collections via the li library management system. So it will take you off to your um, catalogue or wherever that, that content resides, basically. So the main thing is, is to remember that any, any links take you off the VLE platform. So if it's not on that platform, then Blackboard Ally wouldn't be available 
to those that content. So the whole books that would be in the library collection, the, the, the option to download it in a different format wouldn't be available because you're moving away from the VLE. So the integration then breaks. And similarly, if it's an external website, again, the integration wouldn't work. However, a student could download a copy of something and then upload it onto census access to get a conversion in a different way. So the amount, what's likely to be on the VLE, so copies provided from a third party um, would require downloading in a different format, rarely amount to whole or substantial part of the work, which I've just said. So it would be maybe a chapter, an article, or a link to something else. Unless it's an image, obviously, images would be the entire work and probably articles, but articles tend to fall within the the um, parameters of that it's part of a an issue or a volume so it's not an entire work in itself and why has the content been provided obviously it's for teaching or study purposes um, and that's the content that's most likely to be downloaded for study in their own time or private copying um, Content provided for decorative or aesthetic purposes is unlikely to be downloaded unless it's embedded into those notes and those teaching resources like lecture slides, etc. Um, the students wouldn't deliberately be downloading it unless it was interesting to them on a study purpose, you know, outside of what the intended purpose of it being there was. So, you know, th th there are different reasons. So the legal exceptions that would cover a student um, first of all, disability exceptions, obviously, if it's a disabled student or staff member, they could rely on their disability exceptions to download content in any format that they require to make it accessible. But if you're not a disabled student, you don't meet the criteria, there are other options available to you. So section 29, private study and non-commercial research would cover a student making a copy of that content for their own purposes. Equally, illustration for instruction. Illustration for instruction covers the person giving and receiving instruction. So bear that in mind, it's the student as well as the staff uploading the content. So both exceptions are format neutral. They don't expect people to, to upload or download content in the same format it was there. If you think of it um, with respect to if they download a paper copy, that's not the same format that's been provided. So it is being reformatted anyway. This is just giving them options of how they want to access it. If it's something that's been made available under a license, if we look at the CLA license, the only restrictions are that the recipients are only ultimately in possession of one single copy of the content. Again, they're format neutral. They don't mention how the student can download that copy. It doesn't say they must download it as a PDF onto their laptop or they must print it out, etc. It just says they can download a copy. I might, might have forgotten something, so someone can remind me if it does actually say that, but I don't think it does. It just says that as, as recipient can um, should ultimately be in possession of one copy of that item. When we look at the um, options available through these um, accessibility tools, sorry I've got a mind freeze there, um, it, they're normally around sort of reading content, so there'll be HTML, Word, um, PDF, Braille, ebooks, um, the DAISY, they're all around reading content. So there isn't an option, even audio books, basically. So audio recordings. So it's not something that you can reformat from a document into a film or anything like that. So it doesn't go that far. It's just a different way to read that content. So you're not changing it in major um, ways. And the, the audio content, is probably the furthest away from what the original was meant to be provided in. But again, if it makes it accessible, um, there shouldn't be an issue. So the risk, the questions you should ask when you're making your risk assessment, it's um, not a question, basically you should consider that it is a personal copy 
that the person is legitimately provided with, um, download, downloaded by an authorised recipient, but in a different format. That's all. That's the only issue that might be of contention, but there isn't an issue as far as I'm concerned. Like I said before, I may be wrong, so please say if you think I'm wrong. Um, so will it attract copy, copyright infringement claim? It's highly unlikely on the, on the basis of what I've just said. Also, you have to consider the benefits to students of being able to download these copies. So an unencrypted PDF or Word document allows students to make notes, um, to copy paste extracts for quotation purposes, etc. So if they're writing an essay or a project, they can you know, sort of copy paste extracts and, and cite them. So through their citation tools. Um, tag documents have clear headings and structure allowing for easy navigation so students can find what they need easily. Um, it includes an automatic generation of a table of contents as well, again helping with the navigation. Audio MP3, which I said is probably the, the, the most you know, contentious one of, of the conversions. Um, along with it, the original text it allows a, a further engagement. So. Um, especially for students with dyslexia that take longer to process content, it's much easier for them if they can listen to something al alongside the actual um, visual um, extract. It also aids with English and foreign language. So again, with translation, if you've got um, a foreign speaking student that might struggle with English, um, it helps them as well. But also time management. So how many of us would like to listen to something while they're driving on a bus, on a train, instead of having to read something and have to hold it in your hand and physically hold it? I mean, it, it does help when you think a lot of students travel a long way to get onto campus. Um, that would be great for them in time time management um, terms. HTML and EPUB um, provide text reflow, so they read more fluidly um, and, and also enables them to download them onto mobile devices and tablets, etc., which we know a lot of our students prefer to use. So if you're still not convinced, um, these are just additional things. Census access is usually only made available via the institution's accessibility support pages. Um, and within those pages, there are instructions about who should be using the tool, etc. So this minimizes general discoverability and usage, um, or it's supposed to. Um, also, the file uploads for conversion are limited by size, so it's unlikely to accept entire works, entire books, etc. Um, Blackboard Ally is only integrated via uh, the VLE, so it includes controls, etc., which is the button I mentioned earlier that you can toggle on and off for individual items. So if a, an academic is unsure about whether this should be made available widely, they can toggle it on and off, but I doubt they will. Um, so they're just additional um, things to consider. Um, just as a final note, would I mean what, what would be the alternative? We don't lock up our photocopiers to stop students from um, photocopying or scanning entire books. So this is literally just these are just additional copying tools um, and converting. So a scanner is a conversion from print into a digital. This is just another conversion into another format as well. So now I'll hand over to you and I see there's lots of things in um, in the chat box, which I haven't been looking at, but if Chris would like to jump in as well. Yeah. If you. you have something to add, please put it in the chat box or put your hand up if you want to be on camera and speak, but I'll hand over to Chris now. Thank you, Kate. Thank you so much for that. So I'm going to um, stop sharing that screen so we can all see each other now. Um, and we really appreciate you taking the time to go through that. I, there, there are a few questions here and we'll, we certainly do want to get others input. The thing I wanted to just um, uh, mention first was uh, picking up on your clarification that this is not legal advice. And of course, it will have to suffice. But but having said that, that it is um, the purpose of, of having the webinars is to have 
uh, community discussions and we operate uh, and, and the call sig really is operating as a community of practice where we bring people together and it's an extension of what we've been doing for many years um, discussions on list copy seek so there are different views there are different approaches that we might want to take institutionally clearly if we're working within institutions it's up to the, those institutions to make the decision about what tools they use what their how their settings are what guidance they give to their staff and students um, so there are a number of different configurations of how you might work so it's it's always difficult to have a single sort of set of guidance notes that will always be the case in every single situation uh, but we think there are some i think what you've picked out there are some really key points just a reminder of what the the legislation says what provisions there are in the law um, the accessibility provisions are there and have been expanded since 2014 and are really important but then there are those other ones as well and you always look at those as a copyright specialist advisor to try to see how could you apply a bit of this and a bit of that how does it relate to to any given situation so uh, it may be that you know we, we have got um uh you know we've had discussions haven't we about whether this is something we could provide as guidance as a written in a written form and we just felt that the most appropriate way of doing this is framing it as a discussion about what other people are thinking about what they're doing um, and having that as an informed discussion. So thank you again, Kate, for, for giving um, some of that context. So we've had some questions coming up. Yeah, we've had Jane. some great questions coming up, Chris. Um, it would be good to pick up on some of those. Um, so I think the first one, I think we've got had a question that's already been answered, um, thanks to uh, Steve, um, uh, who's answered the questions about to Totara Learn and whether it works with um, that particular um whether whether it works with that VLE um but the first question was whether the about warnings and whether downloaded files include warnings not to re-upload them etc um and Philip has asked a sort of similar questions about whether you ask students not to share audio or other formats outside um the organization I don't know if you wanted to pick up answer either of those Kate um like I said, Middlesex don't actually have Blackboard Ally, although we do have census access. Those warnings to students are in our normal student regulations. And we do, I think there is something on the VLA just in general, telling students that everything provided to them is for their own study purposes and they shouldn't be sharing them anywhere else. But this has come on the back of students sharing things on those um, those platforms like course hero platforms. those kinds of platforms yeah. yes so, so it's, it's a general kind of, rather than specific to these tools yeah i think that's a really good point to make actually um mm -hmm. that that you know we do you know it, in some ways is this any more risky than you know students taking things and sharing them that are provided to them for you know their their study so I see Steve B's got his hand up and he's actually, Steve, you've um, mentioned um, about what you do at the University of Brighton. Do you, would you like to come in? Yeah, I was just going to say that <clears throat> the text that I put into the text, the text that I put into the chat actually comes up as a pop up as soon as you click on download for any of the alternate um, formats. So the student can't actually get to the alternate format without clicking that they've seen that message. OK, well, that's yeah, I think that's I think that's really helpful. Um, and um, Ros has just said something about it, how it would constitute academic misconduct if students shared something that was for personal use. And yes, Emily, you have noticed that Pickle has arrived. She is here on mm -hmm. camera. She's just climbing all over the keyboard. So if random things appear in the chat. That is why. Yeah. Um, but yes, I think that that whole question about what you tell students and how you frame it is really important. And when Kent first got in census access, we developed some wording when I was there. Um, I There's probably a limit to how much I can talk about Kent because I no longer work there. But certainly we did a lot of work with Ben Watson to try to frame it in the right way. So it didn't seem that copyright was a barrier to using accessibility tools, but to clarify the responsibility. And we certainly did. Uh, do a lot of work with learning technologists there about how that information is is provided in the virtual learning environment. 
Uh, but it's all, I, I'm picking up on Emily's question here about on, on the copyright infringement aspect. To what extent are these tools used by lecturers staff to convert files when they then upload, as opposed to individual students instigating the conversion process? So the um, one thing that Blackboard Ally does, again, as Kate says, other tools are available. But one thing it does is it actually scores the accessibility of the documents as they're going in there. So it's not all about providing this format shifting functionality. A lot of it is about getting it right when the module convener is putting together that information. So they do have the ability to use that tool to increase the accessibility of their tools and to prepare it. And that's what we want. The, the ability to convert them into a different format is a is something is a tool for students to use themselves and to say, well, actually, I would prefer it in this format. So there is, you know, it is providing them with that functionality, but it's a combination of the two. So Emily, I'm not sure whether you wanted to, with that clarification, wanted to come in and, and make a point about the liability or had further questions um, or wanted to just say hello to Pickle. Uh, it, up to you if you want like to say hello back she's she's still here so uh yeah she'd be more than happy to talk to you emily um and i know that karen's very big fan as well yes we can hear you we can hear you hiya hello i'm in australia again oh wow um, so i'm si i'm sitting in the dark in australia um in very the late dark, at night. Not, not the intellectual dark um <laughs> no the reason why i asked that question was because the liability for the university could arise in two different ways. One is direct infringement for staff changing third party content. So they get the file, they make the changes to it and they release it. So Kate mentioned that a lot of the content is created by academics or other members of staff from the university. So for those for, she's correct for all that content none of these questions arise it would as she said be for the third party content the other way in which liability can arise is as um, authorizing the infringement of somebody else so that's where the question about the student activity is relevant because basically the liability could come from the university providing a tool which allows the students to infringe and Kate put a photocopier on her slides and it's that's the equivalent right it's just like we think about is there infringement for having coin operated photocopiers now that's turned into scanners computers and so forth <clears throat> I think it may well be that the exceptions analysis plays out a bit differently between those two forms of liability um, because what you can say if the allegation is authorization, you can say, well, we only provided the tool to the extent it would be used lawfully by students. And in fact, a lot of the activity by students would be individually for each student a fair dealing. Um, and so there's no actual, so, so we, we can sort of get away from liability for a couple of reasons. It might arguably be slightly different though if the university itself is converting a whole bunch of material just because of the argument that the fair dealing analysis is less strong if you're making content available so hundreds and hundreds or thousands of students can access that adjusted content. I, I have to say I agree generally though with everything Kate said about in terms of the legal analysis and the risk assessment and how to proceed, but it was just, I think my question was just to tease out those two ways into liability um, and how the arguments might unfold a bit differently depending on who's actually using the tools. Is it the university using the tool or is it the students using the tool that the university has provided? Thanks for that clarification, Emily. That's It's a really good point to pick those out. Kate, I wonder if you wanted to come back on that. Yeah, I totally agree with Emily. I mean, for staff to use it to convert masses of content it's highly unlikely the content we provide to students that might need conversion would be things that we'd scanned under the CLA license but under that license we do have the um, option to make things to convert things or to edit things for pedagogical reasons um, 
to to what extent I don't know. The the major issue, like I said before, would be it converting something to audio. That is a completely different format and has a whole load of other rights involved. So um, if a student was to do, or a, no, a staff member, a student could do that. If a staff member were to make something into audio and upload it on to the VLE for everyone to access in an audio form, I think we'd need permissions and there would be a liability aspect there. But I, otherwise, um, third party content would normally go up in the original um, I would assume in the original format in some way or another so either a scan or, or a link to it which would again take it away from these tools. Thanks for that Kate and um, um, just as a, an addition to this you mentioned the CLA license Kate you're a member of the the group that Jane and I and others are on where we negotiate the CLA license um, there was a discussion we have from time to time a rights holder forum where we can uh, talk to uh, uh, representatives from the publishing industry and also the Authors Licensing and Collecting Society, talk about how that license operates. And we did actually raise this issue a couple of times about the use of these sorts of tools that allowed format shifting. Um, it, it became quite uh, clear that the, this was not a major area of concern for the publishing industry, this sort of thing. When it comes to the CLA license itself, CLA are operating the digital content store. And in fact, the content is stored there. So they are the ones with the responsibility for making them accessible. We'll refer back um, if we can find the link to the, the previous webinar we had on accessibility and all the various ways in which we want to make material accessible. Um, and in fact, I think that there is, I, I know you're, you're raising the fact that yes, you can get an audio file from this and shifting it into a, a, a computer generated narration of a paper. Um, from a publisher's perspective, we were talking about audio books. And yes, they don't necessarily, publishers don't necessarily have the agreements with their authors to create audio books. Um, or if they do, they come under a very specific um, set of contractual arrangements about how that comes about. But these really, in my view, these are not audio books. Um, and I, I think there, therefore, the, the the risk is you've got to see it in that light. It's it's content which is not available under an audio book. It's not like someone's actually narrating it and turning it into something that has an additional value over and above the uh, you know, how much it costs for the institution to get hold of the original, get permissions to get that that content in the format that it's delivered to the student. So I think uh, it's it's. I don't think it's a major area of, of concern about the format shifting, but then it may be that others have different experiences. And, and certainly if it's something where there's large scale format shifting going on, this is this is a different question, I think, is, than what we're really talking about with the way these tools are usually used as a use it as and when it's like equivalent as you and as Emily agreed to a photocopier being available to help you with your studies. We're not using it as a way of, uh, avoiding paying for content legitimately in the first place. Um, I just pop something in the chat, Chris, because um, um, I think it's, you know, I mean, I've actually got um, Blackboard Ally. Um, we're doing a bit of a trial of accessibility tools and we've got a lot of work um, going on at City University. So I thought, what better way to learn than to uh, actually switch it on on my Moodle course and see how that works. Um, and I'm just also putting a link into our digital accessibility guidance that we have, um, which is licensed under Creative Commons as well. Um, so, which is very exciting. But um, I think, um, you know, it, it, I mean, it's clear in my module, everything that's in there is actually content that pretty much I've written. I mean, all my readings are on our reading list system. So it's, you know, uh, it, it's it's kind of, it, it, it's a bit of a non-issue in a way to me, um, but it is, I think thinking about accessibility is so important and it is something that, you know, I've, I've really started to think about when I create a lot of course materials myself, making sure that I'm making them accessible. So, so I think, kind of yeah, I what, what I Caroline, would, yeah, Caroline, Caroline had, did have her hand up for a while, actually, and I didn't know, I know she spoke about a previous webinar. Should we, Caroline, sorry. Yeah, I took my hand down because I didn't want to interrupt what Emily was saying, which I was very interested in. Uh, 
just had, um, we're in the process of looking at purchasing one of these tools. And as well as Blackboard Alley um, and Census Access as separate products, we also looked at the Brickfield Toolkit and I'll link into that. And I would recommend that particularly anybody who uses Moodle takes a look at them because we were really impressed. Um, mm -hmm. It's sort of the best of both worlds because you can either purchase it as a sort of this working the same way as Blackboard Ally does, or you can purchase it with census access included. So then you um, you get both of the um, ways of converting material. So stuff that's uploaded to Moodle, you can it will have the options there to download it in different formats, and you can also have the standalone watch that will allow people to upload other contents. Um, I was particularly impressed with, um, so Blackboard Ally does have some tools um, recommending teaching people about accessibility and recommending ways to fix content on their pages. Um, but the Brickfield approach was um, slightly different and I was really impressed by the way they're thinking about it um, and encouraging people to, to learn about accessibility, creating accessible mm -hmm. content. There are re mm -hmm. remediation tools for stuff that's already on your page was much better in my opinion right um, so, yeah and it was considerably cheaper uh, yeah i would recommend people if you are looking at getting one of these tools talk to these people as well thank you caroline that's really helpful thank you can i just go back to um i don't know if i mentioned it in my talk but we we talk about our scans and things being available on the reading list and also direct links outside but i'm just wanted to just make it, you know, sort of a, a comment that I'm aware that there are universities that don't use either. So they neither use DCS or TACC or a reading, an online reading list. So all their content does go on the VLE. So I suppose this would be more pertinent for them than the majority yeah, of us who use those extra platforms. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you thanks. for that, Kate. So I think we're going to, it's now reaching 12 o'clock, so we're going to draw the conversation to a close. It's been really helpful. Thank you again. I think in summary, what I would say is, I, I wouldn't describe it as a, a non-issue. What I would say is, actually, this is the same issue that we deal with in every area when we're looking at copyright and online learning. There are risks that need, you know, that you need to address the risks and take a risk managed approach. We do our due diligence. We make sure everyone understands what their responsibilities are. Um, we don't do something which is clearly egregious systematic infringement. But nevertheless, there is once you start providing digital access to learning materials, there will be some potential for some copyright issues. Um, so I think it was really useful to have it. Thank you again. Uh, thanks to Emily, yeah, thanks, to okay. Caroline. Uh -huh. Steve. And to the accessibility group that we have um, on the alt call sig as well for the work they've been doing about this. Yeah. 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 And don't worry, Karen, I, the guitars won't fall on my head. They're, they're pretty, they're pretty uh, uh, firmly attached to the wall. Uh, but here we are. Right. So just to, to let you know, future webinars, we do have some lined up. Intellectual Property Office are going to be talking to us next time. That's going to be good. Mm -hmm. So they the, are they've been working on this intellectual property education framework. So pretty important for those of us in this area um we've actually we penciled in becoming a copyright specialist for the first of july but actually i think looking at it that may be the one that we do as our open textbook so i think it's yeah. a watch this space we'll get the website updated with a, a schedule as we slot those things in because we might bump the becoming a copyright specialist back a little bit as well but yeah i think there's lots of lots of really interesting stuff we can hang around for 10 minutes or so um we do like to end as you know with something to lighten things up but um it, i know many of you have to go just play that little jingle everyone get those lighted up. so our webinar comes to its end and we know you have to go you only set aside an hour for this But there's one more gift we'd like to bestow One last thing Only one last thing We know it's down to the end Much time on its way back One last thing Only one last thing 
we stay alive for one last day. Can I put the one last thing up? One last day. Before everybody leaves, Chris. It, it, clearly the song isn't working because we have droves of people um, leaving but there we go uh, understandable <laughs> we do advertise it as finishing at 12 o'clock so the one last thing <laughs> um, it's a thing of beauty isn't it on on both levels yes so here we are in the Sophia Museum of Archaeology um, on yes. our final day can we yeah. have a uh, it's a caption competition this time isn't it uh, although, well, let, let, or is it an let, alt text? Alt text. It's an alt text, and and actually, what was the most interesting thing? We will tell you at the end what the um, the accessibility tools read in this picture. Just how it Who can guess how it describes this picture <laughs> in alt text automatically? So the art at the AI. Um... What did it and that is what a fact is this? Morphic, um, uh, a bowl or jug or something, isn't it? It's not, Chris. Is that how they described it? Um, <laughs> it is. That's what. That's what the actual um, the, the collection item is. The, the artifact is. Um, yes. Uh, yes. It's got some slang coming through from Evelyn. Uh, nice. Yes. Good idea. Yes, Chris. Business end. Um, bottom jug. Bottom jug. Um, yes. Was the tool given any context or just the image, Steve? Just had the image. Just had the image. I've got I've got the text ready to go in there. Shall I shall I just I think paste so. It? I think and nobody's got anywhere close to it. Nobody's got anywhere close to what <laughs> the alt tag was suggesting. It said a person standing next to a big statue of a bear. <laughs> um, so what I did is actually is I, I I just amended that slightly um so uh are we still recording this yeah would you like me to stop recording I don't no think no we well let's one. i think yes i think we should say i hope you enjoyed the webinar today um if you see this later perhaps if you're looking at it on youtube you could put something uh family in the friendly comments below see what in you the think. comments section um but as Chris to what you think so <laughs> thanks yes. very much everybody Now, this is for the people who are really staying right to the end. This is really exciting.